Okay, so let us finish this off. Um, yesterday, I, we saw that the Mobius transforms keep upper half of complexity into itself and I also mentioned that this is uh, the characteris characterization of the transforms that preserve angles between two curves. Now, how are these guys related to what the everything that we are doing? Well, that is uh, defined. Okay, so let me define a particular tau. No, that's not this. Is well gamma one, not to be confused with the gamma function. This is essentially that that is right, the set of all matrices ok. So, these are precisely the matrices we are just investigated the transforms given by top. I am now going to define uh, subgroups, certain subgroups of this group. So, by the way, this is a group under multiplication because of for obvious reasons. So, I am going to define certain subgroups here. The condition, the additional condition is take all the matrices in gamma 1 and C should be congruent to 0 mod 1. So, C should be divisible by the number n which is supplied separately and the number n defines an appropriate subgroup of this. Okay. Why is this a subgroup? Simple reason. The, the only additional condition is that the bottom left entry should be divisible by n. So, if you take two such elements, two such matrices and uh, take the bottom left multiplication, that would be C 1 times something plus D 1 times C 2 C 2. And now C 1, C 2 both are divisible by n. So, therefore, we continue with that. And now, we define Okay. So, you say the function f is a modular form of height 1 and level n, if the following two conditions hold and one is the primary condition really, two is just a slight twist on the one. Uh, the condition is that you apply this uh, any 
of the transforms in uh, gamma n on z and apply f on f on it what you get the value is f z times c z plus d whole square so the new denominator of the transform comes up as a multiplier in the with a degree 2 and earlier what i wrote about height higher we can define for higher height when the this degree is instead of 2 it's more so that's a higher height but we will not be interested in that and second condition is a uh, that f of minus 1 over nz this is not quite this does not quite fall into this because uh, this determinant of this transform is n z goes to minus 1 over nz so here a is 0 b is minus 1 c is n d is 0 so it is 0 minus 1 n 0 so that determinant is n so it is not does not belong to this but it is very closely related to this group. In fact, uh, um, just a simple observation. If you let uh, matrix W be 0, minus 1, and 0, then W gamma n W inverse. So, essentially the matrix W commutes with the group gamma n, it commutes in the sense not with the individual elements, but the, with the whole, whole group. So, this is very closely related to this group and uh, what we are saying is that in fact, what one can show is if this condition is true, then f of minus 1 over n z must be a linear combination of plus n z square f z and minus n z square f z and uh, what this condition is saying is that it should be just one of the two either plus or minus ok. So, that is makes the function a function f which is remember that is the function is of the kind we the Fourier series kind that we are looking at that is the function we started with right this is the function associated with the elliptic curve over rational numbers it is a Fourier series periodic with the period of 1 and uh, then we are looking at at least I said that we look at these transformations on the half upper half plane and see how the function behaves there and uh, that is the behavior of the function not all of them, but that is the behavior of the function we are interested in and these functions is called modular function. Now, this may seem like a very strange condition to why would such a transform be uh, equal to f z first of all otherwise it seems very hard to believe that it should be the case. And uh, even if something like this hold what use does it have well there is a very interesting theorem. Which says that f e this is the Fourier series associated with the elliptic curve e over the rational numbers is a can only if let us see if I can get this expression right. So, this relates this Fourier series representation 
with the Dirichlet series representation that the Fourier series being modular is equivalent to the corresponding Dirichlet series satisfying a functional equation okay. And uh, the of course I fixed the height to be 1 but this is more general theorem holds actually if the height is whatever is the height say height is k then this number 2 which is occurring here here and here becomes 2k. So, the symmetry becomes you know along a real z equals k and the level of course occurs here at these places that the level really represents the multiplicative factor at this point. And this is the central connection with the with the things that we have studied so far and the things that I have new things that I have introduced that if you look recall if you go back. So, I gave the started this proof sketch right. So, you looked at this curve then there is a point of order and it does not have a point if f is modular. So, the f is the that is specific elliptic curve and the phrase theorem said if f is modular then it does not have a point of order greater than or equal to 6. Right, and then we jumped into modular curves. So, what are mod modular curves really are? So, we say a curve is modular. Okay, let me just define that also. So, elliptic curve E we call a modular elliptic curve if the corresponding Fourier series is a modular form of height 1 and some level. So, now everything connects up that uh, what Frey showed was that if the elliptic curve specific elliptic curve f was modular then uh, it does not have a point of order greater than or equal to 6 which means that uh, the discriminant of it that cannot be greater than or equal to 6 which in turn means that the solution to that uh, Fermat's equation does not hold does not hold. And finally, the last piece in the puzzle was put in by Andrew Wiles then then others later on that would show that all all elliptic curves are modular. In fact, Andrew Wiles showed it not for all elliptic curves, but only a subclass of elliptic curves, which was good enough because that particular elliptic curve f did fall in that subclass called semi stable curve, but that is not important. And then later on uh, other uh, mathematicians worked on that proof and generalized it to include all elliptic curves. So, now we know that all elliptic curves are modular which means the corresponding Fourier series have are modular forms which is equivalent to saying the corresponding zeta function associated with those elliptic curves satisfy the functional equation. But this required huge amount of effort. I mean that uh, Andrew Wiles' proof is uh, originally, of course, was more than 100 pages long. It was later on brought down and simplified, but still it is at least 50 pages. Whereas, if you remember, we derived functional equation for our zeta function pretty easily. It required some, it still required some bit of work actually. If you remember, we had to do this uh, going to the Fourier analysis. Right. We did this big sum of uh, 
e to the minus pi n square z and then did something with it and then it came down, but still it was not too difficult. And in fact, this if you now go back and look at that proof and keep in mind that what you are see this keep in mind this equivalence between the zeta function functional equation and the corresponding Fourier series is modularity. So, with respect to our, the, our zeta function the original Riemann zeta function also we can associate the corresponding Fourier series okay. and if you run through the proof of the functional part functional equation of uh, the, the Riemann zeta function the functional uh, structure of the zero zeta function that proof is actually showing also that the corresponding modular function uh, not modular function, the corresponding Fourier form is modular not exactly in this but more or less so let me see it shows that it's uh, the corresponding Fourier series is modular of height half and level 2 half because you see you this is 2 here. So, whatever is the height you multiply by 2 and then that is the line with along which the symmetry holds. So, it is half here and level is 2 because or level is 1 1 or no not 1 totally not 1. What? Here. Root n by two. What was it? It was pi to the minus z, if I remember right. Pi to the minus z. Pi to the gamma z by two, zeta z. So that gamma z by two actually comes. You know, plays a role actually that is where this whole thing flips. See here we are sticking with gamma z. So, there is some transformation that happens which brings in that level 2. Again this is very easy to work out if you just sit down and write it down and work it out. And this proof is actually fairly straightforward it is not at all fancy. The equivalence between the modular forms and uh, the functional equation. You just write down the thing the condition and then verify it in a brute force way. Just work out the details. For example, if you say okay, which direction do you want me to prove? Okay, let us start with this. Let us say suppose f is a modular form and then we want to show that this functional equation holds. So let us start with the left hand side. What is this equal to? So, let us just write down everything. What is gamma z? It is that integral which is a t to the z minus 1 e to the minus t dt and uh, zeta z is n greater than equal to 1 a n divided by n to the left and I will be using that uniform convergence. So, swapping the 
infinite integral infinite sum freely. So, then this becomes sum n greater than equal to 1 a n 0 to infinity square root n by pi n to the z and then there is a t also ok a to the minus t and the t over t fine and uh, so let us do a variable substitution u is so then what you get T is e to the minus pi n u and then d t over t d t is d over u. Now, take the integral summation inside again. what is this sum? What was f? f of e? What is f of e equal to? Sum over n a n e to the 2 pi I think I missed it 2 somewhere anyway 2 pi i n z right. So, this is going to be equal to f of Thing I should stick it to somewhere. Yeah, I want it to there. So, u is t over 2 pi n. So, if you use u over 2 pi n, then t over pi n is 2. What? I will take care of yes, no problem. I is not a problem. And uh, du by u, that is okay, there two cancels out. So, this is going to be equal to f of i u ok. Now, split this integral into two parts going from 0 to 1 over root n and then 1 over root n to infinity. And we look at the first part. So this is actually I'm just mimicking this uh, the functional form for zeta function proof. There also we did this, we did this exponential sum. We replaced it with there was a function w that we defined, and then we sp split the integral zero to infinity to zero to one and one to infinity, and then one to infinity zero to one we worked with and used that. Uh, property of w function to write it in terms of a 0 to 1 to infinity integral that is exactly what we are going to do. So, let us just look at the 0 to 1 over root n this integral. Now, what is f of i u? Because f is modular we should uh, something is not right right. So, f you let us use this one the second condition for f f of minus 1 over n z is this or i u we should use directly the other condition uh, maybe we should f of i u is going to be just trying to see ok two things 
the f is only makes sense when when its argument is on the upper half of complex plane and that is certainly the case f of i u u is positive so it is on upper half of complex plane so that it does make sense to diff, you know to work with this properties of f so what is f of i u use that uh, swapping of this let's use this and see how we can write f so z is i u let's we can actually it's easier to use the second form so let's pretend that uh, let me first do a very little substitution here and let u be uh, 1 over nv then du is minus 1 over n v squared okay then i equals what happens to i when u is 0 v is infinite and when u is a uh, one over square root n then v is one over square root n so i is negative of the integral going from one over square root n to infinity and then what is square root n u to square root oops 2 by square root n v to be that f of i by n v du is minus 1 by so minus minus goes away 1 by n v square and u is 1 over n v so that is dv by v and now we are going to flip this f of i over n v so treat z to be okay so f of i over n v is f of minus 1 over n i v i v is on the upper half of complex plane v is real it's an upper half of complex plane so i can use the other form to write it as plus minus n v square which is i v square okay times f of i v so let's just stick that in i equals 1 over square root n to infinity 2 by square root n v to be z and what happens to this this is minus plus n v square f of i v dv over v so what comes of this so that is perfect except for this power of 2 that is sticking out you know that yeah that's this power of 2 should not have been there i might have goofed somewhere see if but for this power of 2 if you see this integral 2 power that if you forget about square root n u to the z f i u d u by u and the other integral is square root n v to the 2 minus z f i v d v by v so the same integral only thing that changes is the exponent here from z goes to 2 minus z and that gives the functional equation that is uh, so basically what we saying is the total entire integral is square root n u to the z plus square root n u to the 2 minus z times something which is independent of z so when you 
flip z to 2 minus z it becomes it stays invariant except for the sign because of this plus minus sign it can change the sign flipping z to 2 minus z can change the sign and that is what is occurring here uh, where is the theorem yeah okay so i should have said that there is this flip on sign here and i think there is the the that 2 is to be absorbed by here if you stick it 2 here then uh, we start with this, this, this and you stick this then this 2 goes away. And then everything works out. Good, so that is it for today. Um, the takeaway from this, of course, apart from whatever I have described, is that for the zeta functions over rationals for elliptic curves, we have not as much knowledge as we have for other zeta functions. I mean, even the functional form we just got recently, and uh, we are not even close to proving the corresponding Riemann hypothesis for this. See again you can say the same things because of this functional form one thing that immediately follows is that the zeta function is meromorphic it is defined over the entire complex plane fine. And now the middle line the symmetric around line real z equals 1. So, you would want to the conjecture would be that all its zeros lie, all non-trivial zeros lie on the line real z equals one. We have no clue how to prove this. In fact, uh, there is okay. That's maybe I can talk about it next time. There is another very famous conjecture, which is a. Uh, called birch dyer conjecture which talks about specifically about this zeta function over elliptic curves over rationals and about its properties so it's a very famous conjecture uh, is it the smirnan yeah, yeah the birch smirnan dyer conjecture you are right and uh, it's very i mean we, we have no idea how to prove this but it remains one of the major open questions.